This, this message, Living Water, actually connects to Thanksgiving. So we're a, we're a couple weeks late. I hope you're okay with that. But, uh, you know, for us in Canada, usually when we think of Thanksgiving, we think of how we celebrate in Canada. We think of how Americans celebrate it in the United States. And, and that's how we view it. But do you know that the nation of Israel thousands of years ago, and for thousands of years, they celebrated a type of Thanksgiving. Did you guys know that? It was in the month of October, and they called it the Feast of Tabernacles, or the Feast of of Booths. In Hebrew, they called it Sukkoth, and I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. But that's what they would call it. And what it was, kind of similar to the origins of, of our Thanksgiving, it was all kind of surrounded around the last harvest of the year. So for us here in Canada, our harvest usually typically is like summer, fall, done. But within, uh, within the Middle East and the nation of Israel, they actually had three different festivals that were surrounded around this idea of, of a harvest. The first was Passover. And, and the Passover, as many of us know around Easter, really was, that was the very first one. And it was kind of a harvest of of uh, animal husbandry, if you would call it, right? Like their sheep, you know, we, they would sacrifice a sheep unto the Lord at Passover. Um, and that would be the first one. And then, and then 50 days later, they had, they'd have Pentecost. And that was a harvest of, like, of wheat and barley and grain. And then you'd get through to the fall in October, and they'd have the Feast of tabernacles and what that kind of surrounded around a lot of it was around their fruit so that's when they would harvest in grapes and olives and pomegranates and figs and dates and they would celebrate that it would happen in October and uh, it launched this this harvest would launch this feast of tabernacles and it would last eight days the eighth day was the biggest day it was the great day and according to this, like, Feast of Tabernacles or Booths, what they would do is that they would gather and they would, uh, they would sleep out in kind of, like, tents for a week. Maybe it was, oftentimes it was created by, like, branches, and, and they'd sleep out in these tents. And, and, and part of what the Feast of Tabernacles or Booths was all about is that during this harvest, as they brought in this crop of fruit, is that they would oftentimes have to stay out near their crops because it was worth a lot of money, and they didn't want people to steal it. So they'd create these, like, tents or booths so they could stay near their crop and, and kind of protect it and gather it in, and they'd be working all day and all night doing that. But, but part of the, the Feast of Tabernacles or booths was around this idea of remembering where they came from. Remembering where they came from. So you remember... The, the story of the Exodus. Even if you are not a ch- per- church person, you've probably seen a movie about it, uh, the story of Israel and slavery in Egypt and how they, they get out of slavery with, through the leadership of Moses. And now they're wandering around the desert. And the, the nation of Israel wandered around the desert for 40 years and they lived in tents. They lived in tents or booths. And if you remember during that time as well, they created, through God's direction, a tabernacle, which was basically like a temple, but it was a tent. So even God, the meeting place of God, was a tent. It was a tent. And so the Feast of Tabernacles, part of it was a celebration of the harvest, and they lived out in the fields for that time, but some of it was also a remembering. It was a remembering of where they had come from. It was reminding them of the 40 years in the desert while they they lived in tents and God's meeting place or his temple was in a tent. And they would would remember the good things about that. They'd remember the mistakes that they made. And they'd talk about all the stories of that and God delivering them from slavery. So the Feast of Tabernacles was a time to celebrate the harvest and a time to remember. And this all happened in the season of what we call October. And if you're in that part of the world, specifically in the nation of Israel, uh, October is a month of drought. So oftentimes, 
the way the seasons would work in that part of the world is their last major rainfall would happen in the spring. And then through the summer, they would get almost no rain. So I've never lived in Israel, but I lived in Turkey, and it's a similar part of the world, and I can attest to this. It's like June would hit, and it didn't matter what year it was, June, July, August, even into September, you don't see a stitch of rain. Every so often you see a cloud here and there, but you see no rain. And so by the time October hits, it's dry. It's really, really dry. The riverbeds are getting dry. They would, they would collect rainwater into cisterns, these water tanks underneath the ground. And, and by that time, the cisterns would be getting very, very dry as well. And each day during this Feast of Tabernacles, or this Feast of Booths, as they would call it, they would have this water ceremony. So people would be gathering all over. They'd come to Jerusalem, and they'd be, they'd be sleeping in tents made of branches or cloth or whatever outside the city, and they'd be celebrating this harvest festival. And every day, there would be a procession of priests in this water ceremony, that would go down to the spring of Gihon. And they'd take a, pitch, they'd take a pitcher, and they'd, and they'd dip it into the water, and they'd take it. And as, as they took this pitcher of water, there would be a choir surrounding them. So I want you to, to imagine this procession of priests grabbing this water, and now there's a choir And they're chanting Isaiah 12, verse 3, which says this, With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. They chant this. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. The song that they would sing would be a song of of celebration. It would be a song of remembering of what God had done. They'd be looking forward to what God's going to do and looking forward to God's salvation. So this, this ceremony of water and the Feast of Tabernacles, they're celebrating of what God had done, but, but they're also looking forward to the salvation of the Lord and what he's going to do. And so they'd take this pitcher of water and they'd walk back up to Jerusalem and they'd go directly to the temple. And they'd walk up the Temple Mount and they'd, they would go to the altar, the altar where, where the animal sacrifice was, and, and there'd, be, there'd be two bowls there, and the bowls would have holes in the bottom of them. And they'd take a pitcher of water, and they'd pour it into the bowl. And as the water went into the bowl, it would, the water would pour out over the altar, over that stone altar. And oftentimes they'd also have a pitcher of wine, and they'd do it simultaneously, and you'd have you have water, and you'd have wine. It would be mixing. It would be pouring out over the altar. Some of, as they did this, some of what they would be thinking of and looking back to is they would do this in remembrance of their time in the desert. If you remember, they went through periods where they had no water, right? They're out in the desert. And there's a story of, of God directing Moses to this rock, and and God tells Moses to, to strike the rock with his rod. And, and this rock splits open and this river of water flows out of the rock. And it, and it quenches the thirst of this nation of Israel out in the desert. And, and as they poured the water over this rock, this altar, it would remind them of God providing this water for them out in the wilderness. And on the final day, the eighth day, what the priests would do is they would perform this seven times. They'd pour this water over the altar seven times. You know, in the wilderness, God brought water from the rock. And now in this ceremony, there was water flowing over the sacrificial rock in the temple. We have a recording of Jesus, this one recording that we know for certain of Jesus coming to Jerusalem during this Feast of Tabernacles. Don't throw the scripture up there quite yet there, Ian. It's 
So he's coming to Jerusalem, and, and he's celebrating this. It's from John chapter 7, verse 9. This is Jesus coming. And, and in, in John chapter 7, we have the story of his family, his brothers, most likely his mother, are going up to Jerusalem. And they're, they're asking Jesus to come with him with them. And in fact, his brothers are almost kind of antagonizing him. They're mocking him. And they're saying, if, you know, you need, you've been doing all these miracles, you really need to come up and show the world. You need to show the world. When they, they, they're referring to Jerusalem as the center of the world, you need to show the world what, who you are and the miracles that you're doing. And they're, you, can, you can read between the lines there, they have doubts, and they don't believe in Jesus, and they're kind of antagonizing him a little bit. But Jesus says, no, I'm not going to go. They, they head off to Jerusalem, and he waits back. And then eventually, on his own, he goes to Jerusalem secretly. And while he's in Jerusalem, he has all these interactions with people and with religious leaders, and they're asking questions about who he is and what he is about. And on the very last day of tabernacles, that eighth day, I want you to imagine this, okay? The very last day when they're, they're pouring this water out over the altar and they're doing it seven times and the symbolism of that. In John chapter 7, verse 37, it says this. On the last day, the climax of the festival, Jesus stood and shouted to the crowds, anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. You probably read that scripture maybe several times before if you're a believer in Jesus. If you can just leave that up there for people to, to see it. I want you guys to imagine the setting of that, right? This, this pouring out of the water on this altar when they're in the middle of drought and things are dry is a call to God because they are thirsty. They're praying for rain in the middle of the drought. But a desire for more than rain. You know, every so often... The rains would come in October and it would, be, it would show their, their answer to prayers and God's blessing on their life. But they desired more than rain. They desired more from God than rain. They desired a touch from God, a supernatural touch, a desire for the blessings of God, a desire for his salvation like we read earlier in Isaiah. You can imagine in this setting, Jesus stands in the middle of this. And he says, I know that you are thirsty. If you're truly thirsty, come to me and drink. If you believe in me, come to me and drink. And as we know in the story of Jesus, not everybody was thirsty, right? Not everybody came to greet Jesus and drank. In my estimation or my opinion, I think that everybody he came in contact were thirsty. But you know, sometimes even though we're thirsty, we are, we're putting other things in our body. We're trying to quench our thirst with other things. When you are thirsty, what do you go to? Do you go for that coffee? Do you go for that soda, the Coke? Dr. Pepper, the Sprite? Do you go for the Red Bull? What are you going for? And, you, and if you've done those things, sometimes you're trying to quench your thirst. And even though those things, they taste good to your, your taste buds, they're not really doing what water's meant to do. As we know more about our bodies, as the doctor's been telling us, they're telling us, drink water. When I was a kid, growing up in the 80s, man, there was always juice on the table. I don't know if anybody can relate to that or not. Like, it's like mealtime came. I know some people, some families, it's like they put milk on the table. I always thought that was really weird. Maybe your milk family. Milk came on the table. In my family, it was like tang or like Kool-Aid or something else that's probably absolutely horrible for you. Right? Sugar water. 
and it came on the table. And as we've gone along this journey of trying to figure out what is healthy for us, we recognize it's like, what we really need is water. What we really need is water. And you don't know you need that water until you're sick. Doctor's telling you that. And sometimes you don't crave that water until you get used to the water. Growing, with, with my own kids, uh, as they've grown up, all they got was, for the most part, was water at dinner time and lunchtime or whatever, and that's what they got used to. And the more water you drink, the more you crave. My wife, Catherine, who is downstairs teaching the kids right now, she, and I don't think she'd be too embarrassed with me telling you this, but like she typically doesn't recognize when her body is craving water. Like she'll go, she'll go throughout the day and she won't drink anything. And then like the late afternoon hits and then she ends up getting a headache. And oftentimes when she gets that headache, it's like this, she, she remembers, oh man, I haven't drank anything today. And so then she goes to the water and she starts drinking it, but by that time she already has a headache. Do we recognize our thirst for the living water? Do we recognize our thirst for Jesus? Or are we confusing it with a thirst for other things? You know, a a person can debate who Jesus is But when you experience him, the debate doesn't matter anymore. He is the living water that we need. Jesus is the living water. When you experience Jesus, you recognize, oh man, that is what I've been needing all along. That is what's quenching my thirst. And I've been trying to quench my thirst with all sorts of other stuff along the way. And in reality, Drinking that tang for years just made me sick. It makes us sick because it's not what our body needs. We need Jesus. Notice that Jesus... Just having a belief in Jesus is not enough. We need to come to him. He says, come and drink. So there's people who believed in Jesus. But he's saying, if you believe, come and drink. You may be here in this room today or listening online and you're like, yes, I'm a Christian and I believe. And you may know all sorts of people who believe in Jesus. But he's saying to you, if you believe, don't just stop there. Don't just stop there. You need to come and you need to drink. And it's regularly, right? It's like you can't go throughout the day without drinking water. It's something that you need to go to all the time, continually. You know those people who walk around those big jugs of water? used to be popular for a while. It's not as popular anymore. But they'd carry around this big jug of water, and they have water everywhere they go. And they're trying to remind themselves to keep drinking, keep hydrated. And when it comes to Jesus, it's not one of those things where we believe and we receive, and then we just continue on our way. But it's literally like he's saying, come to me. Come to me. Why is it we do this every week? Because we need to continue to come. Come to the water. Why is that that you're encouraged to to open up your Bible and read every day, to pray every day? Because we need to continue to come back to that living water. Come back to it. For some of us, we've stopped coming. And when we stopped coming, When we stop coming to that living water, we get dry. We get angry. We get bitter. We get cynical. There's all sorts of stuff that 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 happens within our heart. You know, it's interesting when we drink water, there's something about water that goes through our system 
and it cleans out our impurities, right? We have our, we have our liner, liver, liver, I said, liver and kidneys. I'm not a doctor. I know, don't know a ton about those things, but I know that they're there to help filter. But they don't help filter unless we drink water, right? And when you have the urge to go to the bathroom, your body is taking out the impurities. And you know what, Jesus, when he said he's living water, you know, he does the same thing. As we go through life, we pick up impurities. We pick up stuff that poisons our system. And Jesus is like, come to me. Come and grab that living water. As you continue to come to me, we're go- I'm going to cleanse you. I'm going to take out those impurities. As we continue in the second part of verse 38 of chapter 7, it says this. For the scriptures declare, rivers of living water will flow from his heart. Come to me, all you who are thirsty. Come and drink from me, Jesus says. For the scriptures declare, rivers of living water will flow from his heart. Do you know that? Uh, Bible theologians and scholars have kind of debated or argued for a long time what it means by rivers of living water will flow from his heart. Who is his? Is it rivers of living water flow from your heart? Is it rivers of water will flow from Jesus' heart? I know it's kind of splitting hairs, but they talk about these things. The grammar isn't clear as to exactly whose heart these rivers of living water are going to flow from. But it's interesting, during the Feast of Tabernacles, when they're doing this water ceremony and everything, oftentimes they would be reading from Zechariah chapter 14 and Ezekiel 47. If you want to write down those scriptures, you can go back and look at it. But basically, these scriptures, these Old Testament prophets were prophesying that this vision of rivers of water flowing out from the temple. Ezekiel specifically has this vision of like this water flowing east and west, and as it flows out from the temple, it brings life, it brings healing, it brings wholeness to you and me and to the nations. Ezekiel 47, verse 12 says this. This is at the very end of his vision. And it says, fruit trees of all kinds will grow along both sides of the river. The leaves of these trees will never turn brown and fall. And there will always be fruit on their branches. There will be a new crop every month. For they are watered by the river flowing from the temple. The fruit will be for food and the leaves for healing. It's not such a cool word picture. As this river flowed out, this is what the prophets saw. This water brings fruitfulness. And the fruitfulness is never ending. It's like the, you know, we, right now we're going through fall and the leaves are dying and they're falling off the trees. And in this vision, it's like, the leaves are never going brown. They, they have life in them continually. It's this everlasting life. And this everlasting life is so healing. It brings healing not just to those near the tree, but it spreads out and brings healing to the nations. Do you know that as Jesus walked around and he preached about himself, he talked about himself he actually began to revert to himself as the temple. That Jesus becomes the temple. The temple was the place, the temple was the meeting place of God. That's where man and God met. And it was the place of forgiveness. It was the place of sacrifice. It was the place of atonement. And Jesus replaces all of that, and he says, now I have become the meeting place of God. You want to meet with God, you come to me. You want to receive forgiveness, you come to me. You want to receive healing, you come to me. So Jesus is that temple. When I look at that scripture in Ezekiel, I believe ultimately it's fulfilled in Jesus. 
Jesus is that temple where all this rivers of living water are flowing out. And whatever it touches and whoever it touches, it brings healing. It brings restoration. It brings everlasting life. Jesus is the place of forgiveness. John chapter 7, verse 39, this is how it ends. It says, when he said living water... He was speaking of the Spirit who would be given to everyone believing in him. But the Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet entered into his glory. Ultimately, what is this living water that flows out of Jesus to us? It is the Holy Spirit. It is the Spirit of God. It is his presence living inside of you. come to Jesus who is the temple, the meeting place of God, and his spirit is poured out upon us. Brandon and Kim, if you guys could come forward. So the question is, how do we receive the spirit? Who gets this living water? I think Jesus made it very clear that it's any who believes, any who asks, any who seeks. Any who believes, any who asks, any who seeks. As you see that scripture, we'll go to it, Luke 11, 9 to 10. This is what Jesus is talking about. It says, so I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receives. One who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be open. What is Jesus talking about? If you, if you scroll down further in the scripture, he's referring to this living water. He's referring to the spirit. Do you believe? Yes. Are you asking? Are you seeking? Are you knocking? Are you looking for that living water? For us to receive, it takes belief. It takes desire. Last week I talked a little bit about humility. I talked about how Jesus lowered himself. He took the the form of a humble slave. And when we come to Jesus, a lot of people don't come to him and ask and receive because there's a thing, there's a piece that is missing in that is that we struggle to humble ourselves. It takes an act of humility to do that, to come to God and to come to Jesus and say, I can't do it alone. I need you. I've been trying to fill it up with all this other stuff. And I'm wrong. What I need is you. It requires us to humble ourselves and come at his feet. Anybody who, who came to Jesus, when we look at the New Testament, came to him and, and, and he filled some sort of need in their life. It's like they came with came with desire they came with asking and they came with humility Jesus I need you the induction ceremony we read at the end of this the spirit had not yet been given why? because he had not yet entered into his glory when you think about that it's so interesting he hadn't entered into his glory What is the glory of Jesus? How did he enter into his glory? Oftentimes when we think of God, we think of him up on his throne in heaven. We think of all the beauty around that. We think of an amazing crown on his head. But when it talks about the glorification of Jesus, it's not talking about that at all. 
It's talking about his glorification by being nailed to a cross. I've been talking about this the last couple of weeks. Jesus was glorified on the cross. That was his ultimate throne. It's crazy, isn't it? It totally blows like our expectations out of the water of what, how a king should be crowned, how he should be glorified. gives us a glimpse into the heart of Jesus and the heart of God and what he is all about. That his glorification was in our eyes, in the eyes of humanity, his humiliation. He was humiliated in front of mankind and yet he and how God sees it is glorification. And he was glorified on the cross. And that broke open the doors of the living water to be poured out. As that altar in the temple was broken wide open. Just like that rock out in the desert with Moses and the people of Israel. It broke open and waters flowed out. Jesus' life was broken open and his living water flowed out. So do you want this living water? Are we hungry and thirsty for it? I want it. I need it. And I want Gateway, I want this church to be a place where we can receive, where we are people that are thirsty and we're coming to that living water. What is it that you're desiring? Because oftentimes our desires end up being wayward desires. We fill it with all sorts of stuff doesn't bring the life that 